And uh, one of the things we take seriously around here is in Matthew 28, it says, go into all the world and make disciples, teaching them all the things that, that, w that they've learned. And the Lord said he'd be with us. And so um, I wanted to show you some of the things we've been teaching people that they're taking all over the world. We make coffee disciples, and when there's no grinder to be had, you can use a rock. <laughs> I couldn't pass up on that one. Um, we had the great opportunity to go uh, participate with a group called Engineering Ministries International on uh, a trip in Lebanon, in Beirut. This was about a month and a half ago now. I did. He's the star in all the pictures. Um, uh, I, I would say, first of all, uh, EMI is a group that mobilizes design professionals, architects, engineers, surveyors, um, all sorts of uh, design professionals to go into the world um, and serve local ministries around the world. Um, we started out, well, I should say, first of all, I had the chance to participate in two projects. Um, some of you may know, but at the very last minute, my plans changed, and I was invited to participate in a project in Amman, Jordan with Habitat for Humanity, so I was, uh, I think we have some photos of building, this is Amman right here, um, building a, uh, a house there for a, a local Muslim family and learning lots of things about the culture and how the building process works there was really great. Um, then we went to, uh, I met Stu up in, in Lebanon, in Beirut, and um, we worked for a group of Armenian Christians. Now, when I say Armenian, I'm not talking about Joseph Armenias, the, uh, the, uh, theological, uh, theologian, whatever he is. Uh, I'm talking about the ethnic Armenians that are a people group whom we don't know very much about. Um, they faced, uh, they are Christians, and they faced uh, major genocide at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, something on the order of a million Armenians were killed in Turkey. Um, we don't know anything about that. That was, our, that was the first, one of the first genocides of the 20th century. Then they were scattered throughout the Middle East, and a large portion of them settled in Lebanon. And so we went to work for a group of Armenian evangelical Christians and uh, design a youth camp for them that, um, that they, they owned the youth camp. It had been occupied by seven different militias through the Lebanese Civil War, and it was our job to redesign the master plan and some of the building, um, the building designs. I won't tell you all about everything that we did. We only have a couple minutes. And by the way, we're going to be probably doing a Wednesday night sometime soon once we have the design work ready to show. But I would say that I had the opportunity to meet these Armenians a year and a half ago um, when the project was, was just in the uh, idea phases um, of whether or not this would actually happen, and I was impressed by their hope. I was impressed with these people that faced, have faced such atrocities that I've never even thought about um, that still hold on to this hope, and it's, it's amazing that to think that their hope is founded in Christ, and that's, what's, uh, that's, what's, that's what keeps them going. And I thought, I've got to be a part of this, if in any way possible. So um, I get there, and the first, you know what the first thing they say to us as we're sitting around the table is, you all bring us so much hope. And I said, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense. How can I bring you hope when you're the one that's gone through all of these terrible things? And I'm learning this process of of hope and rebirth and all of these things that I, I'm, I'm just barely scratching the surface on. So anyways, those are the kinds of things that I'm learning and it was an incredible experience. Um, I'll let Stu talk a little, bit, uh, a little bit more, or Matt, however you call him. Um, obviously, we just have a couple minutes here so it's impossible to share everything that we did and learned um, and are continuing to learn. Um, but I do, wanna, I do wanna share a little, one story. Um, when our, we were there for the first afternoon, we got together as a team, and we were um, standing, sitting up in a, an area, the, the, the site where the camp is is a very heavily sloped site, and we were sitting in an area that was kind of an amphitheater, and it had a view across the valley, and you know, it was very amazing, the view of the valley, and then greater Beirut beyond, and then the Mediterranean Sea. So it was just an amazing view, and we're sitting there um, sharing our testimonies, and sharing our prayer requests, and our expectations of the week as a team, and um, one of the, the men that was on the trip was a little, little older and a little wiser than the rest of us. 
And he said, he said, you know, I really don't have any prayer requests um, while I'm here because right now we're under the cover of prayer. And um, it's really when we get back to the states that we're going to need prayer. And that was a really profound statement to me, and I've been thinking about it since then. And I really realized that we have a powerful ministry here to pray for each other, and not just for people that are overseas, but for each other here. Um, and I just have really been encouraged by the power of that. And, and Brett and I have uh, been prayed for and, and financially supported on this trip by many of you, and we really appreciate that. But we also want to send out that challenge that um, we can continue to pray for each other, um, both here and as we, we travel overseas. So just take that as a challenge, and, and we do thank you and appreciate all of you. So thank you very much. And we'd love to talk to you more about this trip. We've got a lot of things we'd say about it. So feel free to grab us over the next few months. And like Brett said, when we get the, we're continuing to work on the design here in the States and um, using the power of technology to uh, transfer that information back and forth across the country as we finish it up. Um, and we hope to present that to uh, during a Wednesday night session. So um, please feel free to ask us about our trip and we'd love to tell you about it. So thanks. Thanks, you guys. I would add, the Armenians say thank you for your prayers. They said, we know that because you guys are here right now in Lebanon, that more people are praying for you all and us. So they thank you for your prayers. Um, I wanted to just say a couple things. Uh, one is that Jody is back. Um, she couldn't work out the visa issue, so she's back. We're glad she's back. And uh, wave to us so we know. You all know Jody. And uh, she'd love to talk to you, too, about what God is doing, I'm sure. And maybe we'll have her come up next week and tell, tell us a little bit about what's going on in her journey uh, also, one of the interesting things that we get to experience this week in the teaching pool with the site pastors is Gashan uh, Thomas, who is the pastor in uh, Baghdad, Iraq. It's the largest evangelical church in the country. is going to be coming to Muncie Alliance and looking at the teaching pool multiplication model. And um, he's seeking to plant churches in, um, in Iraq. And uh, he has a very unique um, set of challenges because he never knows if, if his church is going to be bombed. It has been um, bombed closely, at least, where it blew out the windows. And, um, of course, uh, people would like to destroy any kind of Christian or Western influence uh, in Baghdad. And so uh, he is going to be here. It's a, it's, he, it's a large church for Baghdad. I think it's over 1,000 people in one church, and he's planting another one now. And the youth pastor was actually kidnapped, and we thought we would never see him again. And nobody usually gets kidnapped and released, as you know. So, but the prayers of God's people prevailed, and he was released unharmed, which is amazing. So we're going to be hanging out um, with this guy. We have a, just a wonderful opportunity this week to um, hang out with, with this pastor. And so uh, I'm trying to think of good questions to ask him. So if you guys have some good questions for me, I'd, I'd like to hear what, you, what your uh, questions would be that would give us perspective uh, as a Western church and how we might um, be praying for that church. Um, so anyway... That, that's, uh, that's something that's coming up uh, this week. I'm going to ask you now to pray with me, and then we'll go into the Word. Fathers, we live our life. There are many challenges that we're facing. And we realize that you're not intimidated by what we look at as impossible. We know that you are sovereign. We know that you are all-powerful, and we know that no one can pluck us from your hand. We know that the very hairs of our head are numbered. And we look to you, Father. We know that you want to meet us in trials. You don't want to rescue us out of trials. You want to meet us in the fire. And you want to shape us 
And we know that we need perspective, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would come and give us perspective through your word that is taught today, would relate to us, bring strength and hope and rebuke to us, would bring the examination of your spirit upon our lives that we might know, Father, and how to respond in life and before you and in trials and before other people. So we commit this time to you and ask that you use this as we saw the potter shaping the pot, that you would use this time to shape us, we pray. Amen. We are in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, Marty uh, did a wonderful job. I listened to it uh, last week, and I learned a lot about myself. Uh, when I don't know what to do, I drink coffee, he says. <laughs> I don't think that's necessarily true, but I found that funny. We're in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and I want to go back just a little bit into chapter 12 to, get, to set the um, scene here. Let's look at verse 14. Now I am ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, uh, because uh, what is not your possessions but after you, I'm not after your possessions but after you. All the churches should have, um, uh, who have helped me share, I, I, I'm really having a hard time seeing today, I'm getting new contacts, be patient, but Paul is talking about that he didn't take money from them. And as a parent, a parent support the children. And while he was there, he used that opportunity uh, to show his sacrifice and commitment to those people. Now, look at toward the bottom of the chapter. For I am, I am afraid that when I come, I may, I may not find you as I want to be. Um, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may, may be quarreling, jealousies, outbursts of anger, fractions, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not uh, repented of their impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery, in which they have indulged. This will be the third visit to you. Every matter must be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. I have already um, gave you a warning when I was with you, and the second time, and now um, repent, uh, and, and now repeat it uh, while absent. Uh, on my return. So Paul is saying, look, I have been there and given you two warnings and things are still the same. Now I'm coming the third time. And upon the witness of three times, God is going to hold you accountable. And these believers were arguing and trying to fight over who they were going to follow. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos. We had super apostles coming in with letters of authority from Jerusalem and trying to bring the message of Christ mingled with the Jewish tradition and mentality of circumcision. So it was the gospel plus. And then the last chapter, Paul actually called these false apostles as messengers of Satan disguising themselves in the light for Satan himself appears as an angel of light. And he's saying, now when I come, I have been patient. But when I come, I am afraid that when I come, I may have to exercise my spiritual authority as an apostle. And I'm afraid that when I come, I may grieve over some of you who have not turned back to God. Because your, your sin is affecting the church. And I'm coming. And you're, I'm giving you time. I'm writing ahead of time. Uh, look at verse, um, toward the last part of this, verse 10. This is why I write these things when I am absent, so that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority, the authority that the Lord gave me for building you up and not for tearing you down. Paul's saying, look, God is being patient with you, and he's giving you time. One of the things I've 
learned about God and the way he deals with me and the way he deals with you is that he's very patient sometimes, almost to the point of, I think, is God too patient? Until I look at my own life and then I think, is God patient enough? You know what I'm talking about here? And Paul is looking at the patience of God as giving time for people to turn back so that they can learn the easy way, not the hard way. And I don't know about you, but I've learned a lot of lessons the hard way that I wished I could go back and I have regret over that I wished I could go back and undo. Because it's brought the discipline of God. It's brought a greater vision of who God is and a fear of God and how he loves me and he's jealous for me and he will discipline me because he loves me and he's jealous for me to have the purposes that he's destined for me to have. And I find that at times God is patient. And when I look at God's patience, sometimes I confuse that as God's promiscuity. He's, he allows me to go on. And if, if I somehow get away with it, I think, hey, I've gotten away with this because nothing has really happened to me. And Paul is warning them that I'm coming and you have a certain amount of time before I come, and I fear that when I come, I may have to be harsh in my authority, and that I may, all, I may even have to grieve over some of you. And he had actually seen his apostolic authority used in ways where people were judged. And we'll look at some of those things. But are you like me? Are you like me? Uh, you want to somehow... Uh, provide the minimum for the maximum a return? Are you like me? I, I think that's human nature, isn't it? It's like, how little can I do to get as much as I can get? And it's a value that we have in our culture, you know? And, and, and we're even conditioned for that because they send out sales flyers and tell you how much you can get for how little. And we think, hey, we're looking for the bargain. And we've kind of carried that culture into the church and into our relationship with God, thinking somehow... What minimum do I have to get to get spiritual blessing? And we kind of live our life like that. What can I get away with without God's judgment? And what can I do minimally to get God's blessing? And we kind of live this kind of thing. And Paul is kind of addressing that here. He's saying, look, just because God is patient and hasn't brought judgment, how should you look at that? Look at it as God's patience to give you the time to repent and work something in your heart that needs worked into before God has to deal with you harshly. And I find that sometimes God does kind of, it appears he's kind of winking at my sin. I've kind of gotten away with it, you know? I, I, it's like when you're driving and, and you're speeding and you see a policeman and and you think, you look at your speedometer and you look at him and he's looking down at the dashboard, looking at that thing that tells, you, tells him how fast you're going and you think, oh no. But, and you look at him, hit, hit his brake lights in your rearview mirror. I live there, I know. <laughs> and then he lets off the brakes and keeps going. And I think, wow, I got away with it. This is great. Uh, are you like me? You are, aren't you? You're laughing at me and you're thinking he really needs some lessons and you're probably praying that God would get me busted so that I would learn some lessons but just remember that when you pray that way um, this is how God deals with you as well so you know listen up do we really get away with stuff if God is not judging it us now, and if its judgment isn't immediate, does that mean we've really gotten away with it? Paul says not in the least. He says, the reason I haven't come and the reason I'm writing you is so that you can get these things in order before I come so that I don't have to be heavy-handed in bringing God's discipline on this church. I don't know, but some of you might have had the book we, were, we had. I think we bought a case of them. It's called 70 Years of Miracles. How many have read that book, 70 Years of Miracles? It's about an Alliance pastor. And uh, it, there's some really interesting stories in there. And I, I know that I have my own stories, but I'm kind of reluctant to share those stories with you. I'd rather share someone else's stories. 
But in one story, there was this church, and he was a district superintendent, and this church wanted this certain pastor. But in interviewing this pastor, who was not an alliance pastor, um, he wasn't really meeting the conditions to be an alliance pastor. And so they said no, and they said, we're going to do it anyway. And they were insistent. And this one guy who was the most insistent on the board, using his power, was judged and taken out of this world suddenly. And I, I look at those things and I think, wow, if God were like that all the time, the church would be more pure. If God did Ananias and Sapphira kind of things in the church, wouldn't the church be a lot more pure? But then I think, I'm glad God is patient because some people repent as God gives them time. And how many times have you prayed for someone, oh God, please be patient with them. Give them opportunity to get this right. And uh, there's a, a gentleman who is really exciting to me. His name is Jack, and he goes to Urban Light. And Jack is a real neat guy. And um, he, he, upon meeting him, Jack told me, he says, you know, he said, when I wasn't living for God, he said, I had this garage, and we had an illegal cable, and we'd watch sports, and we'd get high, and we'd get drunk in my garage. And he said, I knew before I came to God, I would have to kick the devil out. So I, I got rid of all the booze, and I cut the cable, and I kicked the devil out, and I went to church, and I gave my life to God. And one of the prayers that one of the people in the church, Leslie, who is uh, Andrew's wife, prayed is, Lord, please let Jack enter into eternity sober. And two weeks ago, Jack was baptized. And Jack is the kind of guy, they, they don't usually give away titles a lot. We don't do that in our movement much. But they gave the title of Usher to Jack, and he wears this badge, you know, Usher. And he says, Andrew tells me how many chairs to sit up, but I go to God. And sometimes I, I sit up a lot of chairs, and Andrew says, why are you doing that? He says, well, I talked to God, and he told me to sit up this many chairs. And he said, church will happen, and there's just enough chairs. And I love Jack. He kind of looks like he's four months pregnant. And he's got a belt that says Jack. And the last time I saw him, I said, Jack, you're going to have to lose some weight because I can't see your belt buckle, man. <laughs> and I just give Jack a hard time. And Jack's been here on Wednesday night, and we just have a great time. But I, I appreciate that God has been patient in giving him time and that someone had the vision and the revelation to pray that prayer for Jack, and Jack is ready to meet Jesus. And I, I hope he's around for a long time because he's such a witness and he, he does such wonderful service at Urban Light. And I praise the Lord for that kind of thing. And Paul's saying, you know, I'm giving you time. And God is giving you time. And it's almost as if God has prevented me from coming so that you have time to get things ready. I want you to realize today that if God is being patient with you, it's not the fact that you've gotten away with anything. He's actually giving you patience so that you have time to get right with him so that you don't have to learn the hard lesson that you're going to be facing if you don't learn the easy lesson and the soft knock at, God, at your door by God. And that's what Paul is saying. Now, I, I don't like this verse, but it's in the Bible. And you, you, prob you probably have verses that are not your favorite verse that make you really question, what is God really like? When you read the last part of chapter 12 and he says, I am ready, uh, he said, I'm afraid that when I come, I may have not find you as I want you to be, uh, that you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be quarrels and jealousy and outbursts of anger and fractions and slanders and gossip and arrogance and disorder. I am afraid that when I come, my God may humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of their iniquity. Now you think about that. One of the worst sins in God's economy, evidently, is gossip. Because gossip destroys community. And there was a lot of gossiping going, and there were a lot of people undermining Paul, and there were these super apostles who were bringing accusations against Paul, saying, look, if he were really an apostle, he would be paid full time. And since he doesn't take money from you, and since he's working a job, that must mean that he's less of an apostle. 
And I believe sometimes uh, I have the opportunity to tell people often that I'm bivocational. So they think, oh, you pastor a church of 50. I go, well, no. There are actually, you know, soon to be nine sites and a couple thousand people. Well, why are you working? As if to say that if you are, if you are professional, you don't work. And so therefore, you must not have much influence or authority. You must not be much in God's economy because you're working. And so these people were kind of undermining Paul. They said, where's his letters? And Paul says, you're my letters. What God has done in your life is written across your heart for all to be read. And it's not on tablets of, of paper and ink, but it's by the Holy Spirit working in the lives of people. And you are my letter. And Paul didn't care about letters, and he didn't want to play their silly games. But when he came, all the gossip and the undermining and the undercurrents against his ministry and his authority that God had given him, he was afraid that he would actually be grieving over people who would die. Now think about it, folks. Think about 1 Corinthians 11. He says, some of you are weak and sick, and a number of you have died. Because you've taken the Lord's table in an unworthy manner. You have not judged the body rightly. Now this is one of those weeks where you want to teach all positive things. But in the Bible there are also negative things. And part of what this text is bringing out to us is Paul saying, I'm afraid I'm going to be grieving. Just like you have grieved in the past in 1 Corinthians. Now think about it. Some of the people were divided and they were taking food and other people wouldn't take communion with other people. And Paul says, God doesn't like that. Anybody that's gossiping and dividing the body um, is a serious matter. And if God, if you've gotten away with it, don't be uh, arrogant because God will judge that. And a number of you are weak. Some of you have become sick. Some of you have even died because you've not judged the body. You haven't looked at the body the way Christ sees it. That person that you really hate, God doesn't feel that way about them, maybe. And he's saying, I'm afraid that I'm going to be grieving over some people like we have grieved in the past. People who have gotten sick and judged and even died because of not judging the body of Christ, the church correctly. Also, Acts chapter 13, where Paul was out and the proconsul, the governor, wanted to hear the gospel. And there was a guy named uh, Elymas who was trying to prevent Peter or uh, Paul and, and, and um, Barnabas from going and sharing the gospel with the governor. And the Holy Spirit came upon Paul and he said, you son of the devil. Why will you not stop perverting the straight ways of God? Now the hand of God is against you and he has judged you and you will be blind for a period of time. And as Paul said that, a dark mist came over the man and he was blinded and he sought someone to lead him out by the, his hand because he could not see. When the proconsul saw the judgment of God against the forces of darkness working in a man trying to prevent the gospel, God came suddenly and judged him. That's the kind of apostolic authority that Paul's talking about here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he says, This guy who has not repented, he said, I've, I've decided to turn him over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh so that his spirit may be saved. That sounds kind of radical. Ananias and Sapphira, that sounds kind of radical. Blinding people sounds kind of radical. People taking communion in an unworthy manner, bringing division in the body of Christ, that sounds kind of radical, and God doesn't want to put up with it. I have personally seen God do some incredible things that scare me and make me uh, want to repent faster. Because we all struggle. And we all come up against God. And God loves us. And he has jealousy for us. And Paul says, I, I'm jealous for you with the kind of godly jealousy. I wanted to betroth you one and only to Christ. To not have your heart divided. God has a jealous love to you. And in that he wants you to have nothing less than his will and his purpose unfolding in your life. 
But I am afraid, he says, lest as serpent, the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds would be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Jesus. What does the enemy want to do? Why does he want to destroy you? Because you're created in the image of God. The Bible says that we will actually even judge the angels. It tells us that when we're created in the image of God, that, that, and that we have this authority that in the end times we will be judging the angels, wow, that sounds like a crazy thing to say, but that's scriptural truth. And Paul says, I'm afraid that when I come, I may have to exercise God's authority as an apostle, and I don't really want to do that. I would rather build you up than work God's hand of discipline among you. So I don't know if he was going to kick people out. I don't know if he was expecting to blind people. I don't know what he was talking about. But grieving over people who were unrepentant sounds pretty harsh. Now, I'm not teaching this text today, by the way, because I think there's somebody in this church. By the way, I, I, I don't know of anything. You, you, you guys are probably the neatest group of people that any pastor could ever desire to pastor because you're hungry for God and, 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 and it's just a wonderful experience pastoring such a, a group of people who, who want God. And so I'm, I don't think that there's anything going on under currents and I'm not trying to say that there is. I'm just trying to lay out the word so that we have a vision of who God is in his completeness, the full counsel. I know Jesus to be loving I know him to be patient, but I've seen him deal harshly with me and other people. And if I really want to have you grow in your revelation of who God is, I want you to understand the full dimensions of God. That he has an ability, a jealous love for you. That he would go to extreme things to discipline. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And don't resent God's discipline. It's, it's to make you right. It's to bring correction in your life. One of the things I get to do as a pastor, um, I have lots of uh, pastors who, who call me. I have some friends that call me. And this week, one of my pastor friends called me. He says, look, I've got two guys really making my life miserable and difficult. And they're undermining and they're using their influence in the church to take people's um, hearts away from the purpose I believe God has for this and they're doing it in such a way that it's, it's, it's really come to my attention and they're very, um, they're very resistant to my trying to bring unity when I approach them on these issues. And um, I told this pastor, I said, listen, who is going to answer for the church more than you? God has put you in a place where you're going, your accountability is higher than anyone else in the church, and God holds you responsible. Therefore, you need to put on the mantle of your calling and deal with these people. And so my prayers are with him because it's not a fun issue. It's a very difficult situation. And Paul says, I'm afraid that when I come, and therefore I'm giving you time to work these things out so that you might learn the easy way, not the hard way. Now let's read on. He says, um, he says I won't spare those who ascend earlier since um, you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He said, I'm, I'm coming the third time, and it's the third witness. And I already gave you um, a warning when I was with you the second time. And now I repeat it while absent on my return. I will not spare those who sinned earlier or, or any others. Since you are demanding proof that Christ is speaking through me. He is not weak in defending you, but is powerful among you. For to be sure, he was crucified in weakness, yet he lives by God's power. Likewise, we are weak in him, yet by God's power, 
we will live with him to serve you. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Do not re don't you realize that Jesus, um, that Christ Jesus is in you unless, of course, you fail the test? And I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. Not that the people... Uh, not that the people will see that we have stood the test, but that you should do what is right, even though you may seem to have failed, that we may have seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. We are glad whenever we are weak, but you are strong. And our prayer is for your perfection. Now Paul is saying, look, just because I haven't exercised this authority, some of you are saying he's weak. He's not charismatic. He's not a good speaker. He works, so he must not be authentic. He doesn't have letters. And so he is appearing to be weak. And Paul quotes Christ, and he says, when Christ was crucified, and it says in 1 Corinthians that God in his weakness, and that was the part when Christ was crucified. It appears sometimes to us that God appears to be weak. The fact that he let people kill him when he could have called down 10,000 angels would appear that he's weak. But in fact, he's not. For he's raised by the power of God. So we see sometimes of God's patience as looking like it's weakness, but it's really not. And the fact that Paul wasn't bringing discipline and that he was exercising patience and he was giving opportunity was being misinterpreted that he was weak. And Paul says, you know what, I'd rather have you guys get it down so not that we have to prove anything or that we have to be tested and proven in our apostolic authority. I'd rather not test that authority with you and I would rather, you know, have you strong and us weak and appear to continually be weak without exercising authority. I'd rather have that than to come and be used by God in power to bring God's discipline in the church matters. He said, I'd rather appear to be weak. I'd rather not prove my apostolic authority. I'd rather sit back and have you repent and you become strong and me never have to exercise this and appear to be weak to you guys. And that's what Paul is saying here. But what is he calling for? He's calling for examination. He said, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Do you know a lot of people in the church who sometimes cause problems and sometimes people in the faith cause problems, but oftentimes there's people bringing their logical thinking that is not God-centered into the church. And they want to influence the church and they want to influence people and yet they're not even a believer and Christ is not indwelling in their lives. They go to church, they've been confirmed, or whatever, they've been baptized, confirmed, been through catechism, joined the membership class. But are you really God's child? What's the test? The test is, is Jesus in you or not? What is the basic fruit of really every Christian? It's the indwelling of Christ in your life. You see, you can't live the Christian life without the power of the indwelling Christ in you. You can't produce fruit of something you're not. <laughs> and so when Jesus comes into you, he changes your desires, he reshapes you, he puts desires in you that are God's, and pretty soon you begin to live out who you are inside of you, begins to show on the outside, because Christ is in you. And so many people think that if they just go to church, if they just get confirmed, if they just get baptized, if they just go through membership class, they're okay. I remember one of the very first funeral services that I ever did was this old couple, Ed and Alpha Radcliffe. Man, what a memory this is. The first time I met this couple was in the 70s. I was, it was in 1975 when I was accepting my first church, a church of nine adults and some kids. 
And uh, we had a church building, a little white church in a town of about 40 people. Outside of Mackinac, a town of about 1,400 people. And we had an outhouse. We didn't have plumbing. And so we had an outhouse. Now, I'm giving away my age. Do you, how many know what an outhouse is? Can I see your hand? Do you know what an outhouse is? Okay. And I'm not talking about these portable johns that you can tolerate. I'm talking smelly outhouse, a pit where it's just there. It's not something you want to drop anything down there and think you could ever retrieve it, ever. You know, it's one of those kind of outhouses, okay? And uh, the first time I was there, um, I, I, the first Sunday I was there, I was so silly. I didn't know what I was doing, but I was 21 years old, and I was accepting my first pastorate. I'd been through a two-year Bible Institute, similar to what we do here in our two-year ministry training program, and um, they were so desperate that they took a gamble and they invited me to be their pastor. That's how desperate they really were. And I didn't really know what a pastor was, except you preach Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday, and if somebody went to the hospital, you visited them. That was a pastor, because I didn't know anything else. And so I was pastoring, and the first week I was there, now get this, this is in 1975. This is back when, this is back, somebody was saying, oh yeah, I, I'm go way back to Keith Green. And I go, well, that's partly back. <laughs> but I go back before Keith Green. I went back to Larry Norman and Love Song. And so uh, I, those are the real grandfathers of Christian rock. And in 1975, let me tell you, there were not churches playing music like this. You know. And, and so I was so silly um, at this time that I, I, I said, well, can I, can I change music? Can I bring my friends in to play music and they said sure bring them in so I brought in my friends and they set up their electric guitars and their drums and their bass guitars and this old couple Ed and Alpha Radcliffe he was in this nice I, if I remember right and if my memory serves me correct he was in a navy blue blazer with gray pants and a tie and, he, and white hair and he looked just fabulous and his wife is this perfect little gray haired woman with kind of one squinty eye and and her hair is white and in a bun and just as sweet. And, and I'm watching them respond to watching the music. And I thought to myself, oh my, what have I done? <laughs> my first Sunday, and I'm sabotaging the rest of the pastorate there right in one swoop moment. And these people were not happy. They were not happy. But I had told the two teenage girls at the local high school, bring your friends, we're going to have a Christian rock band on Sunday morning. And they brought five of their friends, and I, I preached on John 14, 6, my first sermon as a pastor. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And I gave an invitation, and those five girls came forward and prayed to receive Jesus. And that old couple changed. And as much as they hated the music, they saw what God was doing. And pretty soon, the next few weeks, they were tapping and clapping. And they were the sweetest old couple. And I remember, I remember, and I don't remember if it was Ed or Alpha who died, but I was doing, I was doing the funeral, and the night before was the visitation, the viewing hours. And I was talking to this guy, and I was witnessing to him about Jesus and, and he said, I'm okay as long as I've got my membership in the church. And he says, I'm a member of Lily Bible Church. And I said, hi, I'm your pastor. I've never met you. And I was the pastor, the new pastor at Lily Bible Church. But he never came. But he was on the rolls of the church. And when he shook my hand, I shook his hand and I said, hi, I'm your pastor. I said, I'm going to go home. I'm going to take out the membership book and I'm going to erase your name and you're going to go straight to hell. And then I looked, and then I thought, what did I just say? <laughs> it's one of those times when you, 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 you engage your mouth before you think, which I have a good ability to do. And so the guy was stunned, and he looked at me. And then I thought, you know what? I know what God is doing. He's just shocking this guy so he doesn't put his trust in church membership. So that he test, examine yourself. It doesn't matter if your name is on a church roll. It doesn't matter if you've been, you know, confirmed or baptized. Is Jesus in your life? Because if Jesus is in your life, you will be an unsuccessful sinner, folks. You can't successfully sin anymore because it grieves the Holy Spirit. 
Oh, you can sin. You've got a sinful nature. It's not eradicated. But greater is he who is in you than he that's in the world. And the spirit of Jesus dwells in you, folks. You can sin and you can sin. And God will be patient. But sooner or later, God loves you too much to let you go on in that direction. And he disciplines you and he stops you. And Paul is saying, I want you to stop and do a self-examination. Are you in the faith? What is the test of being in the faith? Is Jesus living in you? And if he's living in you, you will be a miserable failure at continual sin. Now, you'll sin. But suddenly, now, what you used to do, sin, you'd feel, hey, you're cool, man, let me tell my friends. Now, when you sin, ugh, the weight of guilt it comes. And Paul is saying, listen, maybe some of you are culturally Christian. Maybe some of you believe in Jesus, but James says even the demons believe and tremble, but does that save them? No. There is a time, folks, if you can continually sin and continually sin, and continually sin over and over and not feel guilty about it, you better examine yourself. Is Jesus in you? Because he's a jealous God, he's a powerful God, and he loves you too much to let you go off for a long period of time in the wrong direction. And he will bring his discipline to your life. I have been disciplined by God. And I have a healthy fear of the indwelling of Jesus Christ within my life. Every believer is indwelt by the person of Jesus. I don't care about your church membership. I don't care that you were baptized as an infant or whatever else. I could care less my dad he had an 18 year perfect attendance plaque on the wall he had been through catechism and confirmed and when my sister died and he saw the difference that we had as far as peace he said what's different about you And he began to realize that he was missing something that we had. Even though he could go on and on with his religiousness, he was lost. And he says, I'm going into the room to read the Bible, and I'm going to read something in Psalm. I said, Dad, why don't you read something in John? And he opened the Bible to John chapter 3 about a religious man named Nicodemus. And Nicodemus was very religious, and he counted on his birth. I'm of my father Abraham. And Jesus said, don't tell me your father. God can from these stones, John the Baptist says, raise up children for himself. And my dad realized his lostness, and there was a turning point in my father's life when he lost his religiousness and gained Christ. Paul was very religious before he came to faith in Christ. Paul is now saying to those people who are trying to become righteous by observing the law, are you really a Christian? Or are you culturally following the church? Folks, it's time for all of us. Say you're raised in the faith. There's probably people here that are actually raised in the faith that have never really confessed their sin and recognized their need for a Savior because of their sin and invited Jesus in to forgive them. And they don't, their culture, they, they were raised. Some of, we have people here today, the only music you knew is Michael Smith and, and Amy Grant. And you're culturally a Christian. You were grown up with that stuff. Some of you say, well, it was Caven's Call or, you know, it was uh, casting crowns. Maybe you're, you're more recently, you know, going to church. Well, I'm not impressed that you can name Christian bands. I'm not impressed that, that, that you go to the Christian bookstore. 
I'm not that impressed. Are you in the faith? Is Jesus in your life? Test yourself. Examine yourself and see if you pass the test. Are you in the faith? Now, this is a good time for you to look. If you're able to continually sin, you need to examine yourself. Now, I don't mean we're all going to sin. Listen, folks, I sin every day. My attitude's sometimes really bad. The way people drive around here, you pull up to an intersection and they won't go. They start directing traffic and I'm in a hurry and I'm on a mission. Get out of my way and I sin. I'm impatient. I think bad thoughts of people who pull out in front of me. And I often thought if I had the trigger and a rocket launcher in my car like James Bond, those people would be just gone. And I sin in words. I, I, I say poopy sometimes, and, and I sin, uh, and I, I, I sometimes, you know, my wife can tell you I'm not perfect, although she's close to it. She can tell you that I'm not, but I can tell you something. I can tell you something about her, and I can tell you something about me, is that we get uncomfortable and we get miserable in sin. And I start getting convicted and it, the weight of guilt comes on me and I have to confess and I have to go back and apologize to the church sometimes for things I do and say. It proves to me that Jesus is in me and I can no longer successfully sin because God is jealous for me and he's going to discipline me and I would rather get it right than have his hand heavily discipline me. Do you have a healthy fear of God's love to discipline you? And that's kind of the point that Paul is making. I'm giving you time, but when I come, I am afraid. I am afraid of God's discipline if I continually go on and miss those convictions of the Holy Spirit because I know he loves me too much to let me continue in those things. And that's what Paul is saying, examine yourself. And that's why he tells the church at Corinth in the first letter, examine yourself before you take the Lord's table. If you're gossiping and backbiting and, and dividing the body of Christ, man, that's, that's not judging the body rightly. You better get that right before you go to the Lord's table. And this is the truth that Paul brings to us today from the word. Now, I want to close this part, verses 10 through 14. This is why I write these things when I'm absent, that when I come, I may not have to be harsh in my use of authority. The authority the Lord gave, uh, gave me for building you up, not for tearing you down. And Paul says, I have spiritual authority, and I want to use it to build you up, not bring God's discipline. He says, now we pray in verse 7, he says, now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong. I don't want you to do anything wrong. I want you to get that right so that when we come, and I, I, I'm not here just to say, bam, I'm going to get these guys. It's like sometimes if I had that rocket launcher, I'd be really... I would push the button too quick. You know what I'm saying? And Paul's saying, I really don't want to come and prove my spiritual power and authority to bring God's discipline. I'd rather not. And then he says this, finally, brothers, goodbye. Aim for perfection. And I don't think he was kidding. Aim for perfection. Listen to my appeal. Be at one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Listen for the window that Paul is putting out here. The window of time that they have is to aim towards perfection. You know that when you're gossiping, you know that when you're sinning, you know that when you're looking at the wrong things in the internet, you know when you're angry at someone and you want to go off, you know that these things are in your life and don't just tolerate them. 
aim for perfection. Ask God to, to deliver you from those things that you struggle with. Ask God for his hand to deliver. He says, aim for perfection. How? Well, one way is he says, listen to my appeal. I'm asking you to look at Christ, his, his patience. Look at that in a way that he's giving you time to learn the easy way. How do you aim for perfection? Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the teaching that God gives you as people teach you the word of God. Listen to the appeal. Respond to those appeals. Answer to Jesus when he knocks on you through the teaching of the word or when you're opening the Bible in the morning or at night or whenever you have your time of asking God to speak to you from the word of God. Ask him to speak to you and listen to the appeal that he speaks to you out of the word. Listen to your friends as they warn you about certain things. And then lastly, be at peace and in one mind. Why? Because God cares about the community that you're in and that you are at peace with one another and that you are at one mind with the community of faith. Why is that important? Because the church is the temple of Jesus. And what is the result when we are at peace with one another and we are at one mind? He says this, live in peace and the God of love and peace will be with you. Folks, what's the difference between a community, a church community that is at peace and one that's at one mind and one that is not? You ever been in a church that's not in one mind? Do you sense Jesus' presence there? One of the things that pushes Jesus outside the door of his own church are people bickering and not at peace or at one mind with one another. Do you know that Revelation 3 is, is a verse that we use for evangelism, that Jesus is knocking on the door of your heart? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. Well, that is true individually. He's writing to a church. And Jesus is knocking on the outside door of his own church. And he's not present with them inside the church. Why? He's very uncomfortable with gossip and backbiting. He's very uncomfortable with people looking down and, and speaking ill of one another. But he says, if you're at peace, if you are in one mind, Jesus' presence is among you. And we've had such a good experience in Muncie Alliance Church with this whole thing. And it's because we, I believe, starting with myself, learning the lesson the hard way, when the Lord said, this is not your church, and it's not their church, it's my church. And I will defend you if you're standing with me, and if you're not, I won't. <laughs> Folks, I want to tell you that if you want God's presence in your life, be at peace with other brothers and sisters. Be in one mind, and the God of peace and love will be with you. Folks, there are all kinds of programs that guarantee growth in the church, but there's nothing like the presence of God in the church. People with needs recognize God's presence. And when Jesus is in the house, the house is full because there are hungry people that want God's presence. And I want to commend you as a church that this has been like my I have not seen a church like this. I, 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 I am so thrilled with what God does as we take our hands off and let him build his church. And I'd like to just pray these last words over you. I'd like to, I don't know how to read this one verse. Greet one another with a holy kiss. And I want to emphasize holy. <clears throat> 
And I guess in Eastern cultures, guys do that. They kiss each side of the cheek, and the girls do that too. And, and uh, it's, it, it doesn't seem real applicable to me here today, but I think the thing of being at peace with one another and being able to know each other and appreciate each other is a good theme uh, for that verse. Uh, I, mean, I don't mean to explain the scriptures away, but that's about the best I can do. And may, here we go. May the grace of the Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You think about these thoughts.